warm welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for the introductions. And uh, well, I don't need to emphasize uh, to this group the importance of energy as a key enabler of development. But uh, the connection between energy and development hasn't always been that obvious, particularly at the level of international discourse. So for example, take the Millennium Development Goals where energy doesn't figure at all. And the level of effort that's being required to include energy as one of the sustainable development goals moving forward in the regime that comes to replace the Millennium Development Goals. So um, in 2012, recognizing the centrality of energy to enable development, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon started the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. And this initiative is being led by uh, the World Bank and the United Nations, and which it in itself is uh, sort of unprecedented that it's brought together two uh, leading global institutions and sort of aligned its resources to achieve the objectives that the Sustainable Energy for All initiative seeks to accomplish. And the objectives are, uh, you can see the objectives here, so I'm not going to uh, read through all of the slides, but the objectives are ensuring universal access to modern energy services. The second one is doubling the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency. And the third is doubling the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. And you can easily see the con interconnections between the three objectives. So as, uh, as, the, as the conversation was moving at the global level about the need for energy access, at the UN Foundation, what we felt was that it was important to have a platform that brings together all of the social, enter or, well, not all, but that brings together social enterprises that are working in the field of energy provision and provides them a platform where they can share knowledge, best practices, and then feed that discourse into the global conversations that are going on. And uh, given the role of, uh, of, of off-grid energy solutions in achieving energy access, this, uh, the network is an important tool for taking this, uh, the recommendations from the sector and feeding it into the global conversations. So uh, there's... Uh, I just have a slide on the practitioner network that I want to show you. Uh, it lists the number of members. We have around 1,600 members uh, representing more than 190 countries. And um, so one of the things that we've heard being frequently mentioned by our membership as a key challenge is the, access, is the availability of and access to financing for promoting energy access. And um, so in today's panel, what we are going to do is bring together a number of different approaches that mobilize, that help, or that help to mobilize financing to come into the sector. So for example, we will uh, hear from uh, Stephanie Valdez from the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, which is a really promising public-private partnership, and she works particularly on impact investing and market development. So she will talk about the role that Alliance or public-private partnerships, such as the Alliance, can play in enabling finance to come to the sector. We'll hear also from Andrew Lieberman about the role of uh, incubation platforms in getting enterprises to a stage where they can actually apply for financing or where they're ready to talk to investors. We'll also hear from Nasher Kola from Avishkar Investments about some of the challenges in investing in the sector and also what, are, what is it that the investors are looking for before they decide to make investments in the sector. And then finally, we have Piyush Jaju from Onigi who will provide a practitioner's perspective and kind of bring all of these uh, different elements together and talk about the experiences of Onigi uh, since its inception and also talk about some of the interesting financial mechanisms that they have uh, incorporated in their work in Onigi. So with that, let me invite uh, Stephanie to uh, offer her remarks. Uh, so thank you, I'm very honored to be here um, representing the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoops. And it, actually, we are an initiative that's housed by the United Nations Foundation. So Tripta is a colleague, and so I was really honored when she asked me to speak on this particular topic because uh, it's one of my favorites. Thank you. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics, and that's because it's, that's what I do. I can talk about entrepreneurs and getting entrepreneurs the right resources and finance all day. And uh, I'm not sure if this is can you hear me with this? Okay. Um, 
it's really essential to what we do as a public-private partnership. So let me take a step back in terms of describing the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. Uh, as a public-private partnership, we were launched in 2010 with this goal of 100 million households adopting clean cooking technologies by 2020. Of course, we're very sector-specific, but it's because it's a huge sector problem in terms of the 2.6 billion people that, that cook with biomass or rudimentary cook stoves globally. And so we, we developed a market-enabling approach. Everything that we do is market-based. We wanted to, th to get over the, the paradigm uh, when it came to cooking that people gave away stoves and then everybody talked about how it was a waste of money because nobody actually used stoves in three to five years. So we said, let's take a step back. Let's create a market, a global thriving market for this uh, technology, both stoves and fuels, and see where we can get in terms of reducing the incidence of indoor air pollution uh, thereby saving lives, uh, improving livelihoods, and working with women as well as protecting the environment. And when we looked at our business plan, we had a supply, demand, and enabling environment approach. Uh, and so we talked to stakeholders, the manufacturers, distributors, the NGOs, um, the sector builders that had been involved in this, and what they all discussed was that there was lack of a coordination, so we became a coordinating body, but then there was uh, these three pieces needed to be come together in order to create a full circle for energy enterprises in this area. And of course, the number one thing as entrepreneurs, how many entrepreneurs are in the room? How many of you want money right now? How many of you will need money in the next five years to grow? All of you, right? Access to finance was named as a huge issue. So we began our strategy in this in, in 2013 with a couple of initiatives. In 2013, we began with the Pilot Innovation Fund and up there, the Spark Fund. So in terms of access to finance, we created the Pilot Innovation Fund in order to allow uh, companies at each stage of growth, whether you're startup, venture, growth, or mature, to access a, a small pot of money to try a new innovation in marketing and distribution, or improve the performance of your product, or improve the design of your product so it's more usable by the consumer, or even implement a consumer financing scheme. Uh, we also launched the Spark Fund along with that. That first round of the Spark Fund was a little bit rocky in the sense that it was up to $500,000 to catalyze the growth of your company. And why did we want to do that? It's because when we talked to investors like Avishkar, who you'll hear from later, um, as well as others in the sector, they said, I don't want to touch cook stoves. Cook stoves are fragmented, they're small companies, it's never worked, and there's, there was really this perception about carbon finance, which was a ma major revenue stream for cook stoves, that this wasn't something that could be profitable. And so we, we took a look at certain publications in the sector, like From Blueprint to Scale, where we talked about the potential for catalytic uh, capital, grant capital, to get the companies to a size and a professional level that would be really attractive. So uh, the Spark Fund was really designed with that in mind and we we were looking for companies that were already in the growth stage in that first round and we're giving them up to five hundred thousand dollars just to get to the next level with the whole goal of that fund is leveraging uh, additional investment from debt equity or other investors but we had to actually go back and change our strategy on that a little bit. And so the second round of the fund, we, had, we split it. Instead of just going to growth companies, we had venture and growth. And we started to create this pipeline approach. As a startup, you could access the pilot innovation fund. As a venture company, you could access the Spark Fund. Uh, as a growth company, you could access the Spark Fund. And we found different ways of providing this. But the additional thing that we had to add with the Spark Fund in the second round is capacity building. And this is where um, certain partners like the Global Social Benefit Institute have been really essential uh, towards building up the capacity of our businesses. I don't know about you guys, but as an entrepreneur, or in talking with entrepreneurs, they could not self-identify gaps in some ways. They knew some problems that they were happening, but what happened in our application process, when we said, OK, you need to allocate some of your money to capacity building, they said, oh, we'll increase production capacity. That's not what I mean. I mean, how are you going to professionalize your company so an Avishkar or a different uh, investor who wants to come on board well, can actually do due diligence on your company and not run away scared in terms of your financial management, uh, management information systems on your customers, really a professionalization of your marketing and distribution strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then 
it sort of proliferated from there. <laughs> As you can see, there was a lot going on in terms of um, different funds that we've had at the growth stage or through the growth stages to get companies really moved from that startup to scale, from blueprint to scale, um, according to the monitor report. And we've actually started to have more and more enterprises receiving investment. We're looking, we're trying to track as best as we can, but over $50 million uh, of investment put into the sector so far. Um, and we started to get more partnerships on board. So we are working with uh, Deutsche Bank on a working capital fund. This is a uh, grant investment, or we're, we're leveraging grant dollars uh, to create a concessional revolving loan um, fund in, of 6 to 8%, so it covers loan loss reserve and management fees, and it's a way to provide working capital for clean cooking enterprises at all stages in the value chain. Again, stoves, fuels, manufacturers, distributors, retailers, financers, etc., as long as a stove or fuel is part of that chain. Um, and then we've been looking at this capacity building facility, which my colleague just launched this week at Skull World Forum. We're very excited about. In terms of the capacity I mentioned, we've been having great success with GSBI and others training some of our entrepreneurs that have received the Pilot Innovation Fund and Spark Fund, but we know that some impact investors are potentially interested. They're now getting some enterprises to the stage, oh, it could be an exciting investment, but I don't want to spend $50,000 on re overhauling this company's financial system. So what we'll do with this capacity building facility is we'll actually say, okay, you want to invest? We'll put up to 10% um, of, of the amount you're going to invest and we'll allocate that towards some sort of capacity need that will make the investment actually happen. Um, which is a really exciting facility, and we're hoping that this will continue to bring more investors to the sector and um, build the size of these companies to a pretty good amount. And then uh, this catalytic grant, our small grant fund, is something we're just piloting in Ghana. And what we've found that, in, particularly in that country, those enterprises, while quality, were not as competitive for some of our global funds, like Spark Fund um, or the Pilot Innovation Fund. So as a sector builder that has promised support in Ghana, how can we still reach the enterprises? So we found a, a way to create around $100,000 grants in order to kind of put into these companies to make them more competitive for our funds as well as others. These $100,000 grants are given based on due diligence, and that's actually something I, I forgot to mention about the Spark Fund. So we do due diligence on these companies. I don't just give you $500,000 to do what you say you want to do. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to withstand our due diligence first. Again, we take far more risk than any other investor, but um, we do that for both the Catalyst Small Grant Fund and the Spark Fund as a capacity development tool. Quite often entrepreneurs come out of it and say, I've never been asked these questions before, and it really got me to think about what I need to do next with my company. So just to finish off, I know I've probably been speaking closer to my 10 minutes, um, but I just wanted to give you a tangible example about what we've been doing uh, or, you know, have, has a company gone through this and is this making sense? Again, we just started in 2013, but we're seeing some good success. Um, the Pilot Innovation Fund had six grantees in the first round. Uh, one in Cambodia and one in India. Uh, both actually made it to the Spark Fund in the next round afterwards. So uh, I don't know if Greenway, Grameen, and Fred's in the room, but they're around here at the forum. Definitely have a conversation with them if you can. They're a company that used the Pilot Innovation Fund to test marketing and distribution. They found that they, they could design a stove, they could find a manufacturer vendor and, and, and make that happen, but they really didn't know and how to create the right marketing message. And so they used the Pilot Innovation Fund to really test and see and bring new retailers on board. The marketing wasn't necessarily for the end user, it was how do we get new retail outlets with the right marketing messages. And they grew to a size that actually finally made them attractive for something like the Spark Fund. And they actually went from Pilot all the way to a Spark growth round, which is the up to $500,000 because of their high growth in, in a short period of time. And um, we've, we, we follow our Spark grantees quite closely. Hopefully uh, these companies will close in and follow on investment. Some of them already have, and I'd be happy to share more cases and examples of that.
Uh, thank you very much for that, Stephanie. And uh, we've been advised that we have to finish exactly at 4 o'clock. So I won't take very much time here and uh, let Andy, Andy follow next. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Andy Lieberman, and I work with, as, as uh, Tripta and Stevie already mentioned, I work with the Global Social Benefit Institute, and we're a, a social enterprise uh, capacity development program based out of Silicon Valley in, in the United States, and over the last 12 years, we've worked with uh, over 200 social enterprises tackling problems from health to uh, education to livelihoods to, to energy. and. Um, and the program, we actually have two programs now on this Blueprint to Scale continuum. The, um, our online program works with the earlier stage programs that are businesses that are validating their business model. We're, we're very business model centric because we feel like if we can help people, the entrepreneurs find the right business model, they'll one way or another be able to figure out all their, their other problems. Um, so the online program um, provides that, that mentoring and that support. Then the accelerator program is for the later stage enterprises that are preparing to scale, and that's 10 months of, of training and building the business and working on some of those other block and tackling issues for uh, scaling. So um, about four years ago, we saw that, that there was a lot of momentum around the, around the uh, energy sector and a lot of opportunity, so, and, and we decided to um, imp, imp, do extra recruiting in the energy sector. And so for those four years, uh, about half of our cohort have been social entrepreneurs doing different kinds of energy solutions. So we learned a lot. We saw uh, different solar, solar lighting, cook stoves, all the different kinds of energy companies that are out there um, from many countries. And a lot of the learnings that we've done over that time are available on this Energy Map website that we've put together with uh, support from Applied Materials. And there's also a just launched a focus on India section that has a lot of information about the clean energy sector here in, in India. So what, what I wanted to do today is, um, is share some of the, just some, a few lessons learned from, uh, from the time that we've been looking at these enterprises to tee up some of the, the conversation um, that, we'll, that we'll have. And as we were looking at the energy uh, enterprises, we see really uh, three success factors. And there, there are three components. First of all, that the technology has to be right. It has to be a, the, the right technology, but the, the business model has to be right, and it has to, both of those have to be adapted to the local context. So, so if any one of those fails, the enterprise isn't going to be able to, to scale. So, as, you're, so as, we, um, as we look at the enterprises and think of We're trying to do their own design, their own manufacture, their own distribution, maybe even their own finance. And that's really hard, uh, especially if you're going to scale, because all of those pieces of your business have to scale at the same time. So, so that's, that's really tough. What we're seeing now, the enterprises that are being more successful, are like a solar sister is an East African um, NGO that's building a distribution network of women on micro entrepreneurs. And that's all they're trying to do, no more, no less. Um, and they're doing it very successfully and distribute the best products that they can find. An another great example of a specialized company that we have right here in the audience is Lumeter Networks is tackling the, the payment problem of, of smart meters and a cloud-based system for the payments. And they're providing that service to lots of other social enterprises. So, so that's one lesson learned. Uh, a second is that there are a lot of clean energy solutions that have a social impact beyond, say, um, beyond, say, simply providing light, which we know has a lot of social impact too, but they're providing uh, solutions in health or education, and those are, are very attractive to donors, and a lot of enterprises have been able to f find business models that will let them get to pretty substantial scale as, as nonprofits on more of a grant uh, CSR type model, so, which, which is very valuable for a certain level of scale and for certain social issues. So we're seeing like, we, we care solar, provides a, it's a solar suitcase that has a solar panel and inside is the basic equipment for um, a maternal health clinic. 
And so that can go into places off the grid, but it's also being um, a lot of uptake in after natural disasters in places like the Philippines, they can quickly get into places that have lost their power and provide some basic services. Another example from here in India is a group called One Child, One Light, which is the outreach, uh, the foundation arm of Thrive. They have nice little solar lights, but they get them out through schools where the, the charging system is in the school. The kids take the lantern home to do their homework, to extend their productive day, bring it back to school. Uh, so you're helping their education, but you're also getting them to school. Uh, so those types of models, that's, that's funded through CSR. Um, so, so those are very valid models, and people are getting them to, to a good level of scale. Um, a, another lesson learned is that the right type of finance can, can really make all the difference in these businesses being able to be sustainable and scalable. So um, there's a lot of conversation around different models now of, of um, like, uh, lease to own type models or a perpetual lease where the, the social enterprise owns the product and just leases or charges some kind of monthly fee. And I think bo both of these models uh, can work depending on the local context, depending on price points, depending on, on your market analysis. But I just, I just pulled up this graph. This is just illustrative, uh, just to illustrate this from, a, from an investment point of view. Because if we look at this um, for the, um, the, the yellow one, lease to own, the payback period's relatively short. It's a little over a year in this case. So that would let one type of capital, maybe in a situation like that, equity could, could probably work if you have enough capital because you're getting your money back with, with the upside in a short amount of time as the social enterprise. But if you're looking at some kind of perpetual lease model where the uh, payback for the enterprise is a lot longer, then, then that cost of capital really has to be factored into your business model. And, and it could affect the type of, of investment that you're getting. So for, for example, uh, with a long payback period of a couple years, that, that may not work for equity. It might just, once you add that cost of capital into these economics and your, all of your other costs, it could just um, uh, make the business model not work. So, so for those kinds of situations, if that's what your market demands though, it can be solved, but it's through maybe a different kind of investment. Maybe it's through, a, a loan, a subsidized loan, or, or some kind of structured debt where the payback to the investor is based on a percentage of your sales or based on um, royalties or, or, or percentage of free cash flow. So those types of models um, can, can, can make a, a huge difference. And what we do in our mentoring is try to help the entrepreneur really develop a financial model and think these things through and, and optimize it. So the, um, the uh, last, the, the last uh, uh, lesson learned I'll share for now is around the untapped potential of energy solutions for productive use. So uh, while a lot of the products that you see in, in the clean energy space, lanterns, home systems, cook stoves, are really aspirational. They're products that people buy um, to keep up with their neighbors or because they think they're neat or to substitute other um, uh, other solutions, there, it's the, the mindset when you're buying those types of products is very different than when it's something that's going to generate livelihood. And if it's something that's going to generate an income, what we found in talking to the entrepreneurs or what they've told us as they talk to their customers is if there's a business case where if I buy this um, solar charging kiosk and can start a new micro business and can make X amount of money per day and that's cost me that much, they, they become instantly very very uh, quantitative and, and financially savvy at that micro level. So, so that's important, and I think there's, we think there's a lot of un, untapped potential there. I found this, um, this graph, this is from a study that Harvard did actually a few years back, but uh, the, the, there's a huge gap in, across the, the, many of the low-income countries. This, this is global, so I'm not sure where, where exactly India would fit in on this. But um, there are, as we know, there are tons of micro, uh, very small enterprises, and there are a number of large ones. But these, these smaller enterprises that can employ 10, 20 people, there's a lot of uh, demand for that type of enterprise growth and a lot of appetite of entrepreneurs who would like those kinds of businesses. Um, so, so, and what we're seeing is now with, we're, I, th I think we're at a tipping point with a lot of the solar energy uh, solutions for things like dairy chillers that can employ a few dairy farmers or cooperatives, things like um, 
uh, solar pumps for irrigation. And we're starting to see uh, air projects like USAID's Powering Agriculture, uh, Cummins is doing a Power to Prosper program. So there are a lot, there's a lot of interest in this space. And I think um, it's a great opportunity for those of you who are entrepreneurs and looking to be in clean energy, if you can tie it to productive use, because that, what that does is there's a direct, it makes it a lot easier to predict the, um, the, the payback period and uh, bring in, uh, which will help you get the, the financing you need because it, it de-risks it if it can be tied to an, to an income. Because if it's people's livelihood, they'll, they'll want to pay and, uh, and to keep the business going. So I'll, I'll stop there for now and turn it over to, um, back to Tripp, I guess. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, the importance of incubation uh, services that uh, GSBI is a very respected platform that does that, and the importance of services that incubation platforms such as GSBI provide, it's, uh, it cannot be overestimated. So with, uh, let me go to our next presenter, uh, Rahul Shah from uh, GSMA, and Rahul is going to talk about uh, the grants program uh, within uh, GSMA's Mobile Enabled Community Services Program and also the use of technology uh, for, uh, uh, to enable financial mechanisms. Thank you, Tripta, and thank you, everyone, uh, for coming here. Uh, thank you to uh, Sankalp for inviting us uh, to share our experiences. And uh, let me just quickly, quickly step through this. Uh, I work for the GSMA. Uh, which is the Association of Mobile Operators. And if you're wondering whether I'm in the right room, I, I think I am. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of justify that uh, within the next 10 minutes. Uh, we, we represent about 800 of the world's mobile operators. And uh, there is a team within the GSMA called Mobile for Development, uh, which, uh, in which we, we try to bring together uh, various players to solve socioeconomic problems uh, using the mobile. So today's agenda for me is uh, I'll just introduce the MEX program, which is part of the Mobile for Development uh, effort. Uh, we, it's called Mobile Enabled Community Services. And uh, what is the motivation for this program? What is the approach we've taken? And what are the expected outcomes? How we're supporting uh, access to finance? Uh, and also then, you know, a second compartment almost to the talk is what is the mobile connect to raising finance? Is there really one? And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of share why we think there is a strong connect to, uh, to mobile. So we've used this diagram as a reference uh, for us to design the program. Uh, it's, it's thought that there are two valleys of death in the innovation pipeline. And the first one is uh, really early, uh, after R&D, if you wanted to build prototypes, how do, you, how do you raise money there? The second one would be, you know, okay, you've done a successful pilot, but now you want to take the step towards scaling, but there's something in between. Right. That's, that's where you know, a lot of difficulty uh, is seen in raising finance. And we, so as I said, we are mobile-enabled community services. Uh, we use the mobile to deliver, to support uh, the delivery of clean water or clean energy to underserved communities. Our partner in this is the UK government. Uh, we raised money from UK aid, uh, 4.1 million pounds. Uh, that has to be deployed uh, over two years, 2013 to 2014. Uh, about two and a half million, so 2.4 is has been used to create a grants fund, and we, you know, just keeping in mind the previous diagram, uh, the two valleys of death, we created two types of grants. One was the seed grant, which is essentially to address the first valley, uh, where we wanted to so enable people to take the risk, build prototypes, prove their concept, do a pilot project. The second one is uh, a larger grant. Uh, it's called the market validation grant. This is where you're trying to create the market. You're trying to prove that, you know, after the pilot, there is this intermediate step where you're taking the first steps towards scaling up, and that's what this, this grant supports. So very quickly, what was, you know, we've, we've had two rounds of, uh, of grants, and over the last year, so we've given out 13 grants. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit, you know, as to why, uh, maybe after, in the session afterwards, as to why in India we gave only one, right? Uh, we received the maximum number of applications actually from India, 
but only one was awarded a grant, and that is a water project. It's not an energy access project. Uh, the majority is actually in East Africa, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So what is the approach we took? Uh, you know, we started off with evidence. So there was there's research done externally, internally, uh, about what, what are the issues in energy access or water access. Uh, we use that evidence to, to motivate champions. Champions being our operator members, could be energy service companies, could be tower companies, uh, to take the risk and trial, you know, do, run, run some trials, for which we provide at least part of the funding. And then from those trials, those grants, will emerge lessons which, are, uh, which we will get through monitoring and evaluation, and uh, we will use that to facilitate this virtuous circle. What do we expect uh, to emerge from this? The, the highlight is, you know, okay, 270,000 beneficiaries getting access to clean energy or water. But really, beyond the beneficiaries, there's more. Uh, we're going to generate proof points, uh, which we will share with investors, right? And uh, what lessons we've learned. These will be published in case studies. For each grant, we're going to have one case study. And there'll be other, other lessons learned across maybe solutions like pay-as-you-go, uh, you know, the, the lease to own that uh, Andy mentioned. Or it could be perpetual lease as well. So we have, we have grantees who do that. Uh, we've uh, been publishing continuously, so there's uh, already material out there, but uh, the outcomes from the grants will be published uh, towards the end of the year or maybe early next year. Uh, matchmaking for grantees, we're also going to, we started to engage with investors to sort of understand what they're looking for and can we sort of uh, do an early correction, course correction, can we guide the grantees in a certain direction and help them help to create a landing strip, landing strip after the grant project is over. So now we come to the second part, and these are linked, really. What is a mobile connector raising finance? Right? Uh, so let me just explain to you the way you can leverage mobile. There are five channels that we, we talk about. And actually, when we started this process, we, we thought there were three. So people, you know, practitioners have come back and taught us a little bit about how they can use mobile uh, more effectively to manage energy or water services. So the first one you see is machine-to-machine -machine connectivity, which is where you can you know, install a little device in, in, let's say, a solar home system and monitor it. Right? You can communicate with that device. It could be two-way communications. Mobile payments, uh, this is a big, uh, big movement in East Africa, uh, Kenya especially, and we're seeing a lot of, lot of uh, traction there on integrating mobile payments into energy services. Mobile services, which is where you could use a mobile application to better manage your business. Uh, mobile infrastructure, where an en energy service company could power the network, the towers, right? The towers need energy every day, 24 hours a day. And you could have, uh, you could power that and you could distribute power to the community as well. And finally, there's the operator's distribution network. This is one of the hardest ones to crack. Uh, you could actually, if you were to were able to create this relationship of trust, you could use the operator's distribution network to distribute your solar equipment or could be water equipment. So let's talk about pay-as-you-go, which is what we call it, and lease-to-own or uh, perpetual lease. Uh, so pay-as-you-go is, is a way to offer financial flexibility to someone who can't really afford to buy, you know, outright uh, a system, right? Uh, and in this case, if you wanted to, uh, transfer credit, right, uh, remotely, or you want to shut off the device on or off uh, because the person hasn't made a payment. Uh, you wanted to monitor the health of the system. Is it performing well? You wanted to actually understand how the customer uses the system, right? Uh, if you wanted to reconfigure the system remotely, then you could use machine-to-machine -machine communications. Uh, if you wanted to decouple your payment collection with, you know, uh, with the number of people you need to employ for payments, or you want to shorten your cash cycles, minimize leakages, then mobile money could help you. So, okay, mobile enabled pay as you go seems like a good thing, but what's the connect to finance? I think what happens is, uh, and I'll share some examples to back this up, but you get near real time data on your systems, and this is something that investors really like. Uh, they like to know what repayment rates are. 
they like to know whether the systems are performing well. And if you say that you have a thousand, they're actually working fine and that there will be a future. You can, you can gather data on the, on the consumer's uh, repayments and you can start to do credit scoring and you can scale your business more effectively. So community power from mobile is another application which I discussed a little bit in the prelude. Uh, mobile towers need electricity 24 by 7. Right? And there are a large number of these in off-grid areas. And these are often close to the communities uh, and they are owned by large corporations, which is important because long-term con contracts from, let's say, a mobile network operator or a tower company is bankable in terms of a financier's perspective. And this, this model is more common in India than in East Africa. This is the only one which seems to be, you know, uh, where India is a little bit ahead. So recent successes, I mean, do you really have to believe what I say? I don't know. Uh, but I'll, I'll just back it up. Uh, so MCOPA is one of our grantees in Kenya. And they've just raised, a few months ago, uh, $20 million, uh, of which $10 million is debt and $10 million is in equity and grants. Off-grid electric uh, in Tanzania, $7 million in equity. And simple networks closer to home, uh, three million in equity in 2013. So, what, how do these people use the mobile network? Uh, so, MCOPA is completely automated transfer of credit. You, they can monitor the system. They have a two-way M2M solution and mobile money, and they have a Safari Comms distribution network. Off-grid electric is is also you know, leveraging mobile, and so is Simpa. Not as much as MCOPA is. Right. So that's, I think uh, my 10 minutes are up. I'll just summarize very quickly. So there were, I, you know, we, we, have, we have created an approach to allowing people to experiment with very, very low risk. I mean, you know, uh, it's almost free money. It's not quite. There's a lot of work that goes on. Uh, after you get a grant, you have, to, you have to comply with the conditions of the grant. And so we're able to support these two, uh, these two buckets where you know, there's, a, there's generally a lack of finance. And we also see that mobile is in some way, you know, it, it is one of the things that can help you uh, along the path to scaling and to raising money. And we have an upcoming Asia working group in Indonesia. I'll just uh, invite you all to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rahul. So, so far we've been uh, hearing mostly about uh, grants and, uh, and what they do to enable enterprises to scale and to uh, carry on their uh, mission. But now we'll hear a different perspective and uh, talk a little bit about the requirements uh, from the point of view of a commercial enterprise or requirements for, from commercial venture capital side of things. And I invite Nasher Kola from uh, Avishkar. Um, when Tripta asked me to be on this panel, I hesitated quite a bit. I, mean, I thought back to about a year ago, I was on a similar panel, uh, Energy for All conference, um, and I think someone came close to throwing a shoe at me. Uh, and the question that I was asked by this gentleman was, Avishkar considers itself to be a pioneer in impact investing. It is a very early stage investor. It supposedly takes great risks. And despite all this, and despite renewable energy being within your mandate, you have not yet made a single investment in the renewable energy space. Now, that is not entirely correct. We have two investments. Um, Stephanie had referred to one. And we have another one. But that is a grid-connected power plant. It's a grid-connected, biomass-fired power plant with its own plantations, supplying fuel, a lot of um, environmental impact, but nothing in the decentralized and the microspace. And in the one year since that conclave, I think there has been a huge difference in the understanding, as Stephanie and Andrew sort of pointed out, that not everything is the kind of investment which needs equity or which needs expensive equity which is restricted by time. You know, 
if as a venture fund we have an investment, we have an obligation to our investors. And that obligation is to return the funds with several multiples within a specific period of time. Which means that we have to sell the investments that we have made in portfolio companies. And the biggest question, which I think again Stephanie referred to is, how do we exit? So even before we decide to invest in a business, we look at are we going to be able to sell this at some point of time? At a profit or a loss is a secondary issue. But are we going to be able to sell? Is there someone who's going to be willing to buy from us? And who are the kinds of people who would buy from a very early stage fund? You would either have a larger PE fund or you might have a strategic investor who is already in this business. Or if you stay long enough and the company is doing really well, you could list it. The decentralized energy model, whether it be cook stoves, it be um, mini grids, other um, standalone uh, solutions for residences or for industrial office applications, we don't see this. It's very difficult for us to see how we could exit from this. So there are three different types of investments that we have looked at in this space. And we've had um, at least, I would say, 15 to 20 companies approach us. One is where the company requires funding for projects which has, it has on hand, okay. which could be solar rooftops. It could be government contracts for solar water pumps. Um, it could be, uh, as Raul was saying, you know, um, providing energy to telecom towers and then to villages in the vicinity. This falls under the space of EPC or engineering procurement and contracts. This is not something that a venture fund would fund. You have to be able to get the right fund. Um, it could be a debt fund or it could be a high net worth individual. The second is where there are microgrids being set up. Um, could be solar, could be biomass, various types. Here again, the scalability is a problem and it's a linear scale. So every time you want to expand, you have to put capital in. Once again, it's not something that a venture fund would be able to do. Okay. A venture fund invests in something where there is a concept to be validated. And then by validating that concept and by scaling up, you get an exponential rate of growth on your capital and not a linear growth. So the example that I gave earlier, the grid-connected power plant, we believe that that was something which was unique. Nowhere else has anyone tried to set up energy plantations with the sole purpose of supplying that fuel to a biomass power plant? You've got about 7,000 um, megawatts of biomass power plants in India, and the majority of them are not operating at capacity because there's no biomass. So if this model could be validated, and with some 90 million hectares of land lying fallow or semi-fallow in India, you could be sparking something really big. So that's the kind of thing that we would look at. And then the third kind of investment opportunity in the space that has come to us has been um, companies which provide products which go into, say, metering or otherwise monitoring the off-grid systems. Um, generally speaking, for this business, we also see two questions which we have not been able to answer internally. One is that with such a fragmented industry with several players and very low entries, uh, barriers to entry, who do you back? And why do you back that particular person? And the second has been that microgrids could be a sort of transient kind of phase. Say 15 years from now, the grid might and hopefully would have spread to all parts of the country. And we are an India-focused fund, so I'm talking about India. So if, say, five to seven years later, we want to sell our stake and to exit, and at that point of time, the number of off-grid areas has come down dramatically, and the visibility of the grid reaching everywhere seems to be reasonably high, then what happens to this business model? In the meantime, these business models are great. They are doing a great service where necessary. 
and they can also generate a return. But the kind of return would be more attuned to structured debt, as Andrew said, to an investor who is interested in getting a return on a continuous basis on his or her investment, and not a venture fund which is looking at a huge scale up in the value of the company and then exiting. Um, that has been our sort of view on this sector. Um, you know, touching on something that you said, Andrew, in terms of creating livelihoods. So at the same conference where I was last year, after that, um, in the dead of winter, I went trekking up to the Himalayas. And there was virtually nothing available there. Cylinders of cooking gas were being carried by porters on their head over a four-day period to heights of 4,000 meters. Okay. But you could charge your mobile phone. And you could have a hot shower. Both powered by solar. 300 Nepali rupees for a shower, 200 Nepali rupees to charge your phone. And they had a satellite dish which would connect your phone to the nearest uh, mobile tower. So choosing the areas where you are focusing is also extremely important. If there is a livelihood available, people will find the ways. And ironically, this, this, in, this conclave in Nepal was to bring together the government officials of Nepal and people from all over the world to figure out how do you finance microgrids and microhydro in Nepal. And here we were, four days, five days away from the nearest roadhead. I mean, literally, if you wanted to use water, you had to take a stone and break through the ice to get to the water. But where there was money to be made, you had off-grid solutions. So I think this is something which also needs to be kept in mind. Thank you very much, Nasher. That was uh, a really useful and informative presentation, I think. And uh, I would like to ask the audience to keep their questions ready because we are now getting towards the end of our uh, session. And I would like to invite our final uh, panelist, Piyush Jaju from Onagi. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I think uh, this place would be perfect because it's going to hide my tummy. Um, but uh, I think appropriately, uh, I've been giving the last slot, uh, especially because our business is all about bringing energy to the last mile. And hopefully, I can bring some energy to this room as well. Uh, and I think even more appropriately, it's the last because you've uh, got the incubation support, you've got the funding, uh, you've got the public-private partnership, but now it's time to get your hands dirty. But my advice to you would be first get your hands dirty and then figure about, figure, figure about getting the grant and about the other things. Uh, so particularly, uh, I would want to touch upon financing both from consumer financing point of view when it comes to energy access uh, and, and also financing for our own enterprise and given a more practitioner view uh, on, on how we are tackling it. So we've been doing a bunch of stuff uh, with promoting clean energy access in rural areas. Um, and uh, starting from, from, from a very small uh, energy uh, company promoting solar lighting solutions, distribution of solar lighting solutions to over four years, looking into the entire spectrum of decentralized solutions, uh, subsequently home systems, microgrids, also developing innovative solutions around uh, uh, solar computer systems, uh, irrigation systems. <laughs> Uh, and, and also looking into the entire decentralized energy space. And, and, and all these kind of products have, have its own uh, challenges and, and also how we can make it more affordable uh, to the customer. Uh, so particularly, I'll, I'll just run through various different things that especially we are doing in order to facilitate and enable financing uh, to promote clean energy access. So starting with solar lanterns, and uh, th that is one thing that can be sell, sold directly in cash to the customer. But we are talking about a customer base which is poor. And, and by itself, you're talking about something, any, any kind of uh, clean energy solution by itself will be more expensive. And the payback is over a period of time. And they don't have the money to pay upfront. So, but still, 
it's not about making the cheapest product available and kind of pushing it into the market, but still how we can make quality products, pe products which people want, and still make it affordable if we tie up financing in it. So particularly with Lanterns, uh, uh, we've got some grant support. We've set up a revolving corpus wherein we've been able to extend uh, some credit facilities to our rural entrepreneurs uh, and to microfinance institutions through which uh, we, are, we are selling lanterns. Uh, for home systems, uh, we work through all the rural banks across the three states that we are working, as well as with commercial banks who are, given, who are giving five-year loans on solar home systems. And that's how it's making it extremely affordable, even to a very poor person, because you're talking about 150 to 200 rupees being paid every month, and that's the amount that they're paying on kerosene. So especially in these things, what we need to understand is what's actually the person's, the, a rural household, how much is that particular household able to pay on a monthly basis? If we can understand that person's cash flows and then tie up with the product and have developed these innovative financing models, then definitely it's going to work. Uh, uh, so this is, this is what has been our endeavor to understand different businesses, different households, what are their payments, uh, how much can they afford, and then bringing up appropriate financing models, working through banks, working through MFIs, uh, but ourselves keeping a more asset light model because for ourselves to do the financing and collect the financing, that becomes a totally different ball game. We need to have different people. We tried that early on and we failed, uh, especially because the sales guy can't be the hard guy and who's telling the people, oh, you have to pay back the money. It's, le it's left best to people who are experts, especially the banks and MFIs. Uh, particularly on the new innovations uh, that we are doing and uh, especially looking into different financing options for that. Uh, so talking about microgrids, my, where, wherein we are looking into tying financing for a rural entrepreneur or a group, who, group who's operating the microgrid. And then subsequently, our job is to do uh, the design, installation, and maintenance. But the operation is done by a person based in the village, be it an entrepreneur or be it a group, and that person is getting a loan from a bank or a different uh, funding source, and then subsequently that entrepreneur is paying back to that funding source. And our responsibility becomes installation and providing uh, the maintenance support. With uh, solar-powered irrigation systems, we've been, using, uh, we've been using remote monitoring systems and mobile payments. We're operating on a pay-as-you-go basis. Uh, we've developed uh, we jointly developed a remote monitoring system through which you can remotely on off the system, understand the efficiency, track all those things. And then subsequently, there's an entrepreneur who's operating the irrigation pump and then supplying uh, water as per the requirements of different farmers. So that's something that we always have to look into. Each segment has its own challenges, has, needs to have a different outlook on what possible financing option uh, there can be. And there's no, there's no right or wrong method. It's just that uh, in what works in what region. And especially, we've consciously kept an asset light model. We don't want to take the entire uh, capital burden on our books, and neither do, do, the, do we want to take the responsibility of collecting the funds. Uh, so that's what uh, uh, our outlook is and, and how uh, we can specifically look in that aspect. Uh, coming to financing for, for our own enterprise, uh, we, we totally understand the kind of challenges that are there. And, and that's the reason why uh, we are looking even for equity or be it debt, but at softer terms. Uh, and, and that's what our realization has been over these years. Uh, because we are operating in a market wherein we are looking at last mile distribution. There are, there are a number of uh, different uh, variables, challenges involved. There is a fair amount of overheads because we need to have a large team based on the ground. Uh, and neither are we looking for absolute exponential growth. We understand that we have to grow steady, although we feel that we are one of the we are, we, we are one of the fastest growing energy access uh, enterprises based in India. We've been over the past four years we've been growing about two to three times every year, uh, but we totally understand that we can grow we can grow twice every year. But in order, it's not that you can just simply replicate and if if you've grown twice in in the next year, if you have enough capital with you, you can grow ten times or twenty times just in next one year because. It's, it's about going into individual geographies, understanding what the people's requirements are, and then subsequently providing them with the right kind of solutions. Maybe a technology company will be able to grow exponentially. Uh, but with the kind of business that we are in, we want to have a steady growth rate probably two to three times every year, and that's what we are targeting. And, and that's how, and, and 
and, and, and we are looking for an investor who understands that kind of a space, who understands the different challenges that are there, uh, and also supports us uh, in, in that entire space. Because we are talking about developing the entire ecosystem. It's not that there are various different moving paths. It's not like you know, there is one person who is doing one bit of it, the other person is doing the other bit of it. Uh, we started off just by doing distribution. And then we figured out that uh, although products are there, but still there needs to be, with, with, when we are looking into providing energy to solve social problems, there is a lot more that needs to be done in order to develop more appropriate products. So we got into development of products. We got into how we can have, the more, how we can have more appropriate solutions. That's when we started coming about with customization of home systems, developing solar computers, microgrids, how, how we can work. So we got into the product development space just after doing distribution. And at the same time, we also realized that just distribution will not be enough. We need to back it up by financing. So how we can facilitate financing. So we are looking into the distribution, also product development financing. And, and that's what we feel that it's not possible for us to just be doing one particular thing. Let's just focus on distribution. If we just want to focus on distribution, probably we'll just be a distribution of a solar lantern company, and which we don't want to be. We want to, we want to be an enterprise, a technology experts, en uh, energy experts, who can provide a range of energy solutions in rural areas, understand the needs and requirements of these communities, provide them with appropriate solutions in, across various fields. If it's agriculture, then how can we provide solu energy solutions for agriculture, for health, for education? Everything has a link. And, and how we can provide that. Uh, and that's what our approach has been, and so far, so good. It, it's working, so uh, we are not complaining about that. Um, but uh, specifically, uh, what, what, what I would like to say is, uh, I, I think that the, uh, we, we get, we get too, too caught up in just doing the Excel sheet analysis, oh, what's going to work, let's, let's do the numbers. But, there are so many external externalities. Just get on the ground, get your hands dirty, figure out what's working, what's not. There is so much that is you get to learn just by speaking to these people, uh, especially the, our degrees, uh, conferences. I think the kind of learning that we've got from the field, nowhere else uh, would myself or our team would have got it. So that, that's, that's the kind of beauty of it in actually going to the field and. And just doing those small things just brings so much happiness. Um, and actually uh, figuring out what people require and if you can provide those solutions in a sustainable way uh, and develop an enterprise uh, uh, which, which, which you feel is making a difference is, is the most wonderful thing. So I'd like to end on that note. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So I'd like to ask all of the speakers to come to the stage, and then uh, we will. Uh, I'll ask uh, each of you to uh, maybe come uh, ask a question that may you have in mind or that you wanted to ask the other one of the other speakers, and then we'll go to the audience for questions as well. Thanks. Uh, the question for Noshir. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you talked about debt being a more, uh, you know, a more preferred way to finance uh, some of these businesses, especially microgrids. Uh, are there examples of successful raising of debt? Um, I think some of them have probably been able to raise debt, um, especially for consumer finance. Okay. But there are some funds which specialize in debt. And in India, it does become difficult because of ECB regulations, etc. But what I was referring to is not going to to um, funds for debt, but to look at HNIs. There are several family endowments. There are several family funds um, in India. There is the Impact Investment Network out of Singapore, um, where they do bring together HNIs and investors at different stages. And uh, several of those are in fact based in India. So you may not even end up with the FDI regulations, uh, the, the ECB regulations. Um, but looking at investors who are investing partly because of the cause and partly because they would be satisfied with a 10, 12, 15% a year return on their investment over an indefinite period of time, rather than someone who has a finite 
uh, cutoff time by which they have to offload would be a better way to do it. Um, actually, my question is a little bit for, for Andy, who's been at, at least at, uh, new to my knowledge about these alternative mechanisms in, in terms of debt financing. And um, what we've seen is we've actually seen debt in clean cook stove companies. It's challenging that they have to have really really good grace periods because usually these companies don't have the kind of cash flow to service debt. They don't have the kind of cash flow to service debt at 23 to 25%, which is what you'll find from a financial institution in most of these countries, which is why we've sort of created the Working Capital Fund. But I just wanted to see if anybody, especially Andy on the panel, had um, experience with successful debt financing in terms of convertible notes or whether it was a piece of the revenue or other, other ways to pay back. Um, the funds. Well, I, so, so a little bit out of the energy space, but one, one of the things uh, one of our colleagues, uh, John Kohler, is doing in impact investing is an a investment mechanism called the demand dividend, which is a base, the payment is based on free cash flow. And so what that does after a grace period is, is it's very aligned because it's what the, a percentage of the cash that the, invest, that the entrepreneur has is what gets paid back. So we're seeing that work um, in, in a global context. In, in our first investment through that was uh, with a group producing cocoa in, in Belize in Central America. Um, so, so I think those, those types of, of, of mechanisms um, would be what, that's one alternative maybe. So I guess that's uh, similar to what I've been saying as well, that maybe this industry is not ready for a straight up commercial funding and that you need some kind of accommodation such as this, which is a hybrid between just grants, which are not sustainable over a period of time, but not at the commercial end either, which is not affordable by the industry. Piyush, you were nodding your head. Some yeah, absolutely, I, I, I agree. Um, typically, for, for what, what we see is that even if we're looking at getting debt, it should be not at market rate, less than market rate, or even when we're looking at investments for ourselves, we're looking at impact-first investors whose return is expectations are also not to on the commercial side, like over 20%, but something a little more reasonable. Uh, so I already see a couple of hands up in the audience. So if there is, um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, bringing the microphone to him. Hey. Hey, Rahul, uh, obviously as a provider of pay-as-you-go technology, we agree with you that pay-as-you-go is crucial to scaling finance without scaling the, the cost. Um, but I wanted to challenge to this, one of the assumptions you made and in, in stated in your thing, which was that machine-to-machine -machine communication, i.e. mobile enabling devices and mobile money are critical to providing pay-as-you-go. Um, certainly we don't do that, um, partly because to add machine-to-machine -machine communications to our pay-as-you-go meters would double the cost of this one and triple the cost of the other one, which you probably can't see in my hand. Right? It would double or triple the cost to, to provide mobile communication to the device for almost no increase in functionality. And mobile money in most countries, except in, in East, East Africa, which is why you pretty much only see mobile, -enabled, mobile money enabled pay-as-you-go in Kenya, typically adds 20% to the cost of moving the money around compared to other methods of moving money out of villages like, for example, mobile top-up networks like we use in Peru. Um, so I, I want to question those assumptions and say, if we're going to take this to scale, we have to be critically active at looking at how we get these costs down so that we don't make the cost of the payment equivalent to the cost of MFI interest rates. So. <laughs> Thanks for the question. I guess you're from Lumeter? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I didn't know. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, there is definitely a cost involved. So we don't see, for example, solar lanterns, you know, uh, being equipped with M2M devices. Uh, at least, I mean, we're aware of at least one trial that's going on, but it's not very popular. I mean, uh, but we do see higher value systems, like solar home systems, uh, being equipped with M2M communications. And all of these examples that I shared with uh, Simpa or... Uh, MCOPA or uh, Off Grid Electric or even Phoenix, who's another grantee, uh, they're all reasonably expensive systems. And 
the relative cost of adding M2M is not as high as you as it might be if you added it to a lower, you know, a, a cheaper piece of equipment. And Coco is twice the price of the equivalent product in the same market. Absolutely, but but the point is it's the point is it 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 has traction, right? So the market is accepting it, right? That's I think that's that's where it is. It's it's about making it affordable. Uh, it may be very expensive if you look at the long term, right? Uh, it may be, it may actually double the cost, as you say. Oh, but the fact is that people can purchase it and can consume that service within, you know, immediately almost. And uh, I think that's where uh, that's where the benefits are. Mobile money. Uh, I've I wanted to talk about this a little bit, uh, as I said in the uh, in my in my talk. Is we see a lot more action in East Africa, and definitely it's because of M-Pesa. Uh, we're beginning to see some traction. Uh, we're beginning to see interest from the mobile network operators here uh, as we're sharing these examples with them. And they're beginning to look at this as, okay, you know, maybe there is a way uh, to, to structure this so that we don't charge the consumer. Right? Maybe it's a merchant service charge, and it could be something like 2%. That's not too bad, right? Uh, there's also another benefit of trying to use mobile money uh, for, for payment collections. And this benefit accrues to the operators, really. Typically, you see people are sort of you know, reluctant to try out something new. They don't trust new technology, necessarily. And if you tie it to something which is essential, like energy, right, then they sort of, OK, they're, they're willing to experiment with it. And they become more comfortable to, in the use of mobile payments. They begin to trust it a little bit more. And that's where the operators really see the benefit. Because then you start to see people using mobile payments for other transactions as well. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a benefit to the operators. But operators are looking at how to subsidize you know, uh, for the customer. They could charge the merchant. Great, thank you. I think there, were, uh, there was somebody in the second row. And let's take a couple of questions together. And then please say who your question is addressed to. And then we will have the panel members respond. Well, firstly, I'm going to apologize and say this is actually not a, a question. So in advance, apologies. Uh, my name's Amy, and I'm with Deutsche Bank's Global Social Investments Group. And uh, we host a series of funds where we provide debt funding traditionally to microfinance. And this is actually in response to your earlier questions on who is out there providing debt funding to uh, solar companies. And we are. Uh, so we've provided debt funding to D-Light, to Orb Energy, as well as Greenlight. And so we're currently raising a, a new fund that will wear solar and, and just clean cook stoves. Of course, we're working on the uh, clean cooking stove fund as well, where we're bringing this online and we're looking to be the impact hybrid provider to this need. And other players are coming in as well, responsibility with their Shell Foundation. So it is, it is coming. That's all. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, the gentleman in the fourth row. Hi. Uh, this is addressed to Stephanie and Andy. We are getting into production of biomass pellet fuel. And currently, we are looking at the commercial cooking market. Uh, we are interested, how, but we don't know how to address the rural market in terms of because it's fragmented, it's uh, lower paying capacity, so uh, you know, in terms of social impact, would be higher impact to address the rural market. But I don't know what assistance is available from these various institutes so that we could actually cater to the rural market for uh, fuel. Great, and I think somebody uh, right behind you, if you wouldn't mind passing the microphone. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, I have a very fundamental uh, question to ask. Uh, so I come from a company called ERM. We are environmental consultants. And we have something like a low carbon enterprise fund. So we kind of you know, promote uh, companies which are into low carbon ventures. But while working for this particular initiative, there is one very fundamental uh, issue that I keep on thinking. And I, it, it could be answered by any of the eminent panelists here. Uh, you know, do you all have a specific gradation mechanism when you all talk about a successful investment in terms of um, the jobs created, the people impacted, and the environment uh, or 
you know the 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 low, the low carbon or the carbon uh, neutrality of that particular initiative how do you all grade these three when you all say it's a social uh, uh, venture that is being promoted is it only um, you know on the on the basis of the environmental impact that that particular initiative is having or also on the basis of the jobs and the uh, indigenous skills possibly that it's promoting thank you Great. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to ask whoever can answer this. Um, there was no mention of uh, voluntary carbon credits as an additional income stream. I know they're going to be water credits for water type projects. So could you expand on that and, and maybe give me some indication of um, what percentage of uh, the income stream that, that that could be. Okay, so let's uh, let's take these questions, and then maybe we'll have a couple of couple of minutes for another set. Uh, so let me go to Stephanie first for uh, for the question about uh, um, the the last question that uh, uh, that the lady in the back asked, but uh, also the question uh, about um, it was the first one that I forget. For rural. Right. Uh, okay. uh, Actually, first of all, great question on carbon, and I, I did leave that out of my discussion because I had a limited amount of time. And actually, uh, the the finance team at headquarters for the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves is two people deep, and so my other my colleague works quite a bit on carbon finance. So, uh, in answer to your first question, voluntary credits are absolutely a, a fantastic and additional revenue stream for enterprises. If you can get certified, uh, uh, your project certified on the voluntary market, it is a, a definite way to use that income to grow your company or to finance growth initiatives within your company or finance the education piece, the marketing and the distribution that are so essential to your company's success. But um, what we found is that in the clean cooking industry, pre-2011 or 12, when the, mark, the, the compliance market crashed um, to about 50 euro cent per ton, is that everybody was using carbon credits to actually subsidize the, the, co the cogs of the stove. Um, and that's, that becomes a fundamental flaw in your business when you were selling a carbon credit at, say, um, 11 euros or so a ton and all of a sudden you can only sell it for three or four euros that's a fundamental flaw in your in, in your revenue stream and your business model that you have to change and some of these companies have had to pivot quite a bit what i will say in terms of clean cook stoves in the carbon market is that we finance a study that's done by the ecosystems marketplace group on the voluntary market and taking a look at clarifying a, a quite opaque market. To be honest, there's so many uh, deals done and you don't know whether at the host, wholesale or retail price, what is a, a reasonable price per credit. Um, cl clean cook stoves credits, especially through the gold standard, are still selling far above 50 euro cent and impact investors are scared of carbon and what we've been trying to do is convince them that it is a viable revenue stream. With every company, it's different in terms of the percentage of their revenue. Uh, I would say it depends on your deal. It depends on your broker. It depends on how many stoves you distribute. It depends on the efficiency of your stove. Um, so it, I would say the important thing is to not subsidize the actual cost of your product, but to use it in terms of your growth initiatives. And we have quite a few different financial products. or We've just launched a financial product to get up to certification cost covered. Um, and then we are looking to generate demand for credits as the alliance. Um, very briefly, in terms of your fuel company and rural distribution, um, there are a lot of business models that, that are, are being tested and being successful. Maybe I'll let Andy uh, generate on them. But I would say uh, fuels businesses are open and have been supported by all of the funds that I mentioned in the past. And I would say in terms of rural distribution, you really do have to think through this, this business model and the cash flow. What I've seen really, really helpful is getting the, the hub and spoke model, but with a lot of trust in your, in your spokes, essentially. A really good example in Africa is Ecofuel Africa, which is a spark grantee. They don't do pellets, they do briquettes, um, and they're actually um, going through the GSBI program currently. And they actually 
built kiosks and paid for the full price of the kiosk for women to sell their fuel. And then women were able to actually put other products within those kiosks and they were able to have the impact um, that they were looking for as well as they got distribution down quite quickly in really rural areas. Um, I, I could just add on the on the distribution. I think if you're if you're trying to distribute yourself, then you can look at a lot of other uh, models on the on the Energy Map website. There are a lot of people that focus on rural distribution, and it's it's of course very different than urban. And, but if you're already doing say urban, you you'd have to think about: Do you really want to do the rural yourself, or is there somebody you can partner with? Because there are a lot of other groups especially in the rural areas through NGOs or through these hub and spoke models that already exist that you could add a new uh, product offering that a, a lot of people would like. So, so I think it would be just to, to ask around and there's other people who could probably point you more quickly to, to good partners too. And then on the uh, social impact question, a great, great question. I think for, we, we, we don't like to, to grade. I mean, we're, we're a capacity development uh, provider, so we want to help everybody reach their, their full potential as an enterprise. Um, and we help the social enterprises define their own metrics because at the end of the day, it's, it's your enterprise and you're starting it for an impact. So if you can articulate the impact that's environmental, uh, number of lives touched, the number of jobs created, those are all great metrics. And as long as you can articulate how the, your work and the investment in that uh, leads to those social impacts, then that'll help you find the, the right people who care about those impacts and, and give you the support and investment you need. I'll talk a lot, but I just could add to the social impact question. That's a really great question, and we all are trying to answer that. How, we don't grade. I don't think many, I don't know many funds that actually grade an, an, um, an, an enterprise based on their impact. I mean, you have gears, which is the rating system, but what I've actually heard from some impact investors is that uh, the, the, the grassroots companies who are having potentially what they thought a lot of impact are really low rated on the gear system, whereas a startup company that's quite flashy and got all their systems in place and processes and HR manuals aren't really having the impact, but they're really highly rated on the gear system. So uh, at, the, at the Global Alliance, we're trying to figure out how we can have monitoring and evaluation because there's a development aspect to what we do. I think carbon is really a great way to begin to think about how there's impact. If you're a carbon certified program, there are a lot of other pieces of data that you can collect. Um, and then we're trying to find if there's a set of metrics specific to our industry that we can sign up, give as a package to enterprises to collect. Of course, we collect employment and other data on all of our grantees and are beginning to look at that in terms of success. So I'm sorry, but I think that at this point we will have to end the session because I'm to being told that uh, we definitely have to finish now. So, <laughs> so I would like to thank all the speakers for their comments and their presentations and to the audience for, uh, for their participation. Thank you. <laughs>